on YouTube. My name is Clemency Burton Hill, and thank you so much for joining us for what should be a very special insight indeed into the Royal Opera House's new production of the Meistersinger von Nuremberg, which has been created by the director of opera here at Covent Garden, Caspar Holton. Now, we are in for a real operatic treat. As well as speaking to Casper himself about the inspiration behind his new production, I'll be talking to cast members, Gwyn Hughes-Jones and Rachel willis Sorensen, as well as Bryn Tervel and Antonio Papano, the music director at the Royal Opera House, will be here to give one of his characteristically illuminating insights into Wagner's powerful score. Also tonight, we would love to hear from you, so do join in the conversation using the hashtag ROHMeisterzinger and uh, let us know where in the world you're watching from. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Die Meistersinger, it centres around a guild of master singers in the city of Nuremberg probably work that one out. They've developed a craft-like approach to song and music writing. A travelling knight called Walter von Stolzing arrives in Nuremberg and he falls pretty much immediately in love with the daughter of one of the master singers, Ava. Ava tells him that her father has offered her hand in marriage to the person who wins the Midsummer Song Contest, which is to take place the following day. Well, not being one of the master singers, Walter immediately seeks to become a member of the guild. However, his trial song, which violates many of the rules of the guild, is roundly rejected. Full of contempt for their backwards ways, Walter attempts to elope with Ava. However, their efforts are confounded by a midsummer riot. Instead, the master singer Hans Sachs helps Walter to write a new song for the competition. This new song extends but also respects the formal rules of the master singers and they are swept away by its ardour and duly award Balta the prize. Well, to tell us more about this extraordinary opera, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce three of the main characters of the opera. Please welcome Bryn Tervel, Rachel willis Sorensen, and Gwyn Hughes-Jones. Welcome, welcome. First of all, thank you all so much for being here because I know you've had a very busy day at rehearsal, so it is lovely to see you all. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Bryn. You are celebrated as one of our greatest Wagnerians. You've played not only Hans Sachs, but many other roles besides. What is it about Wagner that you're so drawn to? Why does his music so suit your voice? Uh, I think it's the danger of Wagner, in a sense. Uh, especially with this role. I sang it last time with the Welsh National Opera in 2010 uh, and opened the book a couple of months ago and it was like a new opera once again. Does that uh, normally happen? Because you must revive different... Uh, yes, it normally time. happens with Wagnerian operas. You have to keep it... Uh, it's like uh, riding a bicycle. But you have to keep on studying it and revisiting it. Um, we're in the third week of rehearsals at the moment, so when you think you know certain acts very well, when the director gives you something to do with a shoe or with a hammer, everything you've learnt goes out of Forget the window. Forget about it. <laughs> so I would also maybe suggest, from a personal perspective, that Wagner is helped by the direction you're given, a geography on the stage and it gives you a certain impulses with the words as well. For instance, today we ran the whole of the first act, and that was wonderful to start preparing everything now with all the characters on the stage. And you're really painting that palette with many different colours. So in the next two weeks, I think, uh, there'll be a crescendo towards the fact that the orchestra join us on the stage as well. So that it's very exciting. incredibly exciting. I mean, yes. even for you as seasoned performers, presumably that moment when it all starts to come together is very special indeed. It is indeed, but I haven't sang many Wagnerian roles. Wotan I have sang. I sang uh, Wolfram in Tannhäuser and Hans Sachs, and this is my and second Hans Sachs. The Dutchman? The Dutchman, he's, uh, he, he comes back to, to land now and again every seven <laughs> years. <laughs> Um, but uh, what's incredible with Hans Sachs, of course, is you'll never know until you get to either the piano dress rehearsal or the dress rehearsal when you actually sing the whole three acts. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's going back to the slight danger of 
Wagner. It's, it's very, very important that you pace yourself. And uh, Hans Hotter famously said, the best performances of Meistersinger he ever sang was in his music room at home. Hmm. <laughs> That's not so good. That can't happen this time, guys. There's a lot of people depending on you. Uh, Rachel, it's wonderful to have you. You were Thank so you. recently seen here at the Opera House in the Rosen Cavalier as the Marshalline, now playing Ava. They are women at such very different stages of their lives. How do you jump from one role, one opera, into something completely different? Or are they so different? <clears throat> well, that's funny you should say that, because I was just thinking earlier that they do have a couple of things in common. There are women in uh, very masculine worlds, each of these characters. But it's true, they're at different stages of their lives. And it's interesting to look at love from the perspective of the marshal, and who, are, who I would say is much more like Hans Sachs than Ava, um, and then to look at it from the perspective of Ava, who's so much younger, and she sees it all as like, al almost in a passive way, like she's swept up in this love, and she has no choice at this point. She says, at, at a point in the opera, she says, I love him so much, I have no choice. It would be, a, I'm forced to be with him. I, ca I can do nothing else, you know? Whereas the marshal says, she takes a step back from her love and says, no, we have to do what's right. And I mean, it's very, they are different, but they are both, like I said, these women surrounded by men in a world of men kind of powerless until they decide to claim their autonomy. How does that sit with you as a 21st century woman to be playing a woman <laughs> so, whose life is entirely dominated by Well, men? it's interesting. It's topical, the way we're telling this story. And I would say... Um, Maybe it's unexpected the way we've decided, the direction we've decided to go in the end of the third act. And I'm, I'm on board. I think the way we're telling the story is unconventional, but it's uh, logical. It reads. I mean, for me, it's really working. And like I said, to be a powerless character, but then to claim the character's autonomy through the evening, that's, that's a nice, that's a really nice thing. That's an empowering position to be in and so that's actually really enjoyable. I won't ask you for any spoilers but can you give us a sense of how an approach like that comes about? Is that something that you and Casper talk about you know during rehearsals? Was it a vision that he came in very clearly with from the outset? Was it something that you felt strongly about? Uh, well Casper had a really strong concept and I needed to have him explain it to me a lot. I, I enjoy deeply to go from the psychology of a character primarily if you start from the inside, I think basically what comes out will all work. But you have to be on the same page dramatically. We have to know what the story is that we're telling, how we want to tell it, and what the characters are feeling. And we did, I think we did that very successfully in the past three weeks. Wonderful. Gwen, you are also no stranger to this opera. You performed it uh, recently playing Walter with English National Opera to very great acclaim. Vocally, what would you say is the biggest challenge in this role? Um, I think it, it's one of those roles that you wait, everything you do in your preparation as a singer from the time you start, it's to prepare to sing these roles. So basically the, the preparation for a role like Walter, it's a 30 year preparation. It's not uh, just by opening a book and, and studying. So the challenge is that to be strong enough, of course, just as, as, as Bryn is saying earlier, to have the stamina to be able to do it. But to play a young character, to, have, to sound youthful, mm. to, to express yourself in a youthful way, to, to be able to do it elegantly, um, in a sophisticated way, and, and um, that, that fits his character, that fits his background, that fits the fact that he is a nobleman. Um, and at the end, you know, you, you, you've, you're four and a half hours into the, into the show, and, and you have this song Still that Still got an hour knows. to go. <laughs> that you've got, to, you've got to get up there and you've got to do it and it has to sound, you have to sound as fresh as a daisy and it's, it's one of the biggest challenges. And that's why I say everything you do in, in repertoire, it prepares you, prepares uh, you uh, technically, it prepares you stamina-wise in order to take on these roles in when you're ready to take them on. But there's an interesting paradox there, isn't there, in terms of it being a 30-year process in order to sound as youthful as possible? Yeah, it's one of the most difficult things for, for, for tenors in particular because the, the, the really famous tenor roles like, like Walter, like um, Manrico in Il Trovatore, De Grio in Manolesco, you, you have this problem with them that they're, they're extremely difficult roles to sing. So you need the maturity of voice, you need the stamina, you need to be almost like a, um, an Ironman athlete. But also you need that youthful quality. And you have to wait f for, for yourself to mature in years to be able to take th these things on, but also still sound young. So there's a sort of line somewhere where it crosses. 
and the, the greatest, spot. Yeah, absolutely. And the greatest singers, you know, if you think of, of Luciano Pavarotti, Benjamino Gili, these guys, they, they were able to sound young for as long as possible. And mm. that's how they were able to sing these roles so successfully and last so long. Let's talk about the stamina thing, because even by Wagnerian standards, this is an epic marathon, really, of mm. operatic heights that you have to scale. How, how do you physically prepare for it and how do you actually do it? Well, there are magnificent sections within the Meistersinger and in every act, when you sit down and listen to everybody, all of your colleagues, uh, there are moments that you think that that sounds magnificent. And uh, from the perspective of Hans Sachs, when you think of the character, most probably there are colors on that palette, you know, humanity. Um, he's got a, a humor. Uh, he can be uh, aggressive, he can be angry, he can be very sad. Um, in a sense, she should have married Hans Sachs because they would have been a very happy couple. No doubt. But uh, like Wotan, uh, he <laughs> made that choice to help Walter because at the end of Act One, he's lost that competition. Mm -hmm. And Hans Sachs could have stepped in immediately and swept Beck Messer to the side mm -hmm. and won her hand. Got the girl. Got but the girl. Um, uh, th that story uh, developed, didn't it? And of course, he can go away and, and write another song and another poem to another girl, mm -hmm. and she'll come back to Hans Sachs again some other day. Yeah, but, my uh, sister all, the sequel. <laughs> all, these, all these things are going through your mind. Uh, you have to think, of, for instance, in the first act, all these wonderful characters of who's on what side. Uh, you know, undoubtedly, Hans Sachs is the guardian of the spirit of the master song. But he also writes these for the people. Um, whereas Beck Messer, he is, uh, he is the policeman uh, that's very careful and very strict. And it's dangerous, in a sense, uh, that without Hans Sachs, he keeps them on the balls of their feet to bring a youthfulness. And then, of course, Walter comes in and plants a seed yeah. uh, that maybe he is the new uh, virus that can take over Nuremberg uh, away from their uh, perfect idyll. Uh, so it's, it's a very interesting, you know, the monologues that I have, uh, they're very uh, insightful, probing monologues. And then he, he has these wonderful um, speeches in front of all the people. Mm. Also, so there's many things that you can gain from, from the six hours of music that you do, do so here. is it the case then that the music and the text, that they sort of energise you as you go along? Rachel? Oh, that's a good... I mean, it's... Listen, it's not as hard for me. I don't have as much to say as either of these guys. But um, the character... My character has some very challenging moments, but certainly the stamina is not to the same degree as it is for either of them. But um, I was gonna say, maybe for the audience, I think when you tell people how long it is, they think, well, I couldn't possibly, I mean, a lot of people say I couldn't possibly sit through it, something that long, but I think, no, you could. It's just like binge watching a television show. Mm -hmm. That's what I tell people. Yeah. It's like Netflix. You just, that you come in for six episodes. You're committed. <laughs> they're gonna be, they're gonna be <laughs> potty breaks. It's gonna be okay. I was, one of the, I, was one of, I was one of those people. I was one of those people. Yeah. I was a Verdi Puccini. Uh, Leon Carvalho, Giordano, very Italian Verismo guy. That's, that's what I was. Two and a half, three hours in the Opera House. That's great. Beach Wonderful. Bash, great. Bash. Go home. But um, Meister Singer is so and, special. Yes, and it's I know. So and, and people had said to me for years, you know, oh, you know, you will, one of these days you'll do Walter, you'll sing Walter, you'll do Lohengrin, you'll do... And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then uh, all of a sudden the opportunity came to, to do the part. And I thought, you can't really have an opinion about these pieces without actually going to, to listen to them and to see them. And I thought, hmm, five and a half hours in an opera house? <sighs> That's a long time. And it, I, I swear, I, I went to see uh, uh, when Brynn did it in Cardiff which in Richard Jones's production. And the lights went out. And then all of a sudden six hours had gone just like that. And, and it is the I magic thought, yes, of Wagner, and I think <laughs> for a lot of people. How many people in the audience here, by the way, have sat through long Wagner operas? 
See, there it so is. So you're already on side. You are the box set binge watchers. But I do think for a lot of people out there that it, there's something about Wagner and something to do with that is also about the length and the kind of epic scale of it that, that puts people off or maybe daunts people. How do we get the message out there that actually there's a magic that happens in Wagner? Because I was exactly the same. My first Wagner in an opera house was Tristan. And I remember thinking, I, I won't be able to do this. And I went back the following night. Yeah, I, I think I think the Meistersinger, ironically enough, as long as it is, it is it is like the magic pill, mm. because it's there is delightful. such humanity in in it, and every single character you see there, you see their the, the greatness, the positive uh, values in their characters. You see those negative things, the jealousy, the, the anger, the, the envy. It's humanity there in a very, very sincere and a very, very honest way. Mm. And I think that if you can engage, if, if you have that, that played in that respect on the stage, there's no, nobody can escape. You can put a 10 hour show on and people will still get sucked into it. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think my, the Meistersinger is one of those pieces where you sit there and you say, my God, you feel, you feel the lump come into your throat or you laugh and, or you say, how, how did he write that? How did he do that? Mm. And it's already, and it's, it's, it happens. Um, and and I, it's, yeah, it's a very special piece, yeah. truly. True. And I, if I may say something, the first time I saw it, I was pregnant with twins and I was so exhausted and I thought, I can't make it. But it was such a delight. I mean, from the first moment, it has such a lightness to it. People assume, I previously assumed that Wagner was a heavy, it's heavy, mm. because it has such gravitas and sometimes, it's really profound, really expressive and challenging, but it also, it has everything in it. That's why it's such a big deal. It has every element of the human experience, in my opinion. And the lightness of Meistersinger is almost like an operetta. I mean, the, in the beginning, the first scene, it's, it's almost, it has that feeling like, it's just, it's, it's almost like an operetta. It's really light, it's delightful, and it's to entertain and to, yeah, it just, and, but, and then you go through this whole evening, and like you said, the characters, are incredibly human, incredibly yeah. relatable. So, it is a work that everyone has sung, everyone has done. It's such a monument in the operatic canon. And I'm just wondering, when you're approaching these epic and iconic characters in this opera, how do you make them entirely your own? You must be aware of the ghosts and the shadows of those who've sung here before you. Do you do you listen to other accords when you first approach a, a a, a part like this? Do you, do you go to the libretto first? Do you get into your zone? Do you listen to other recordings? How do you, how do you start to put it all together? Well, if I had the key to unlock those uh, answers, um, I, I'm not sure what would have happened in my career because it's hard work, dedication. Uh, of course, you, you're on a, a lake in your own boat. Uh, you want to try your best and try and achieve something together with your colleagues as well. And in that equation, you have to put, of course, an orchestra and a chorus and a conductor and a director. And these days, I think you're guided uh, predominantly by directors uh, with their insights and how a set looks on the stage. So it's very important who's designing those sets as well. Mm. Opera houses are now uh, may be much more uh, modern and can accommodate uh, bigger sets and uh, more magnificent uh, technology. Uh, as will we be, I will we be seeing much of that in this production? Can you give us a Well, I'm not going to give anything away. So <laughs> I tried. Because we haven't finished the, the rehearsing process yet. So Fair enough. We still have to tell the story. Um, but whenever you walk into any opera house, there's a history of people that have walked on those uh, magnificent stages. Mm. So I don't think you can help yourself by thinking of what's happened on those stages. But, you know, there are people like uh, Sir Geraint Evans or Stuart Burroughs or Gwyneth Jones or Margaret Price that have helped us uh, in our journey. And uh, you can only learn from those people. Uh, only the other day we were having a Zitzprobe uh, with the orchestra when you sing for the first time you sit down and you sing with your score and I pulled out this blue pencil that I have uh, it was given to me by Sir George Schulte I still have it wow. 
So he's always, he was always punching my shoulder about tempo and learning your work to the best of your ability for other colleagues. Uh, so these things are helping you on your way. Those layers and how the, yeah. presumably one thing plays into the next. How have you found working with that dream team, Casper Holton and Tony Papano? It doesn't really get better than that, I imagine. Rachel. Yeah, it's been really wonderful. And there's kind of a familial environment, I would say. The cast in general is just great. I mean, there's a really high standard, generally. And we're trying to do something wonderful. We're trying to do something important. And I, I feel there's a good collegial spirit in the room and a, a synergy, so to speak. It's, it's, it's been really wonderful. Everyone's involved. Everyone's pitching in to contribute to an overall Glorious whole, that's the goal. And how normal an experience would that be, Gwyn, in the opera world? Does it feel like a different sort of approach to a production? Mm, not, I mean, I think you're only as good as the people you work with. Mm, I yeah. think, you know, you can make people look great and they can make you look great. And you can make people look and sound awful and they can do exactly the same to you. And I think you need people on the same page. People who, uh, who inspire each other, people who push each other on. Um, and I think that, that it... I, we, we're unbelievably fortunate here in the UK. You know, we have great companies in this, in this country that have the capability. They have fantastic orchestras, fantastic theatres, fantastic uh, uh, technical staff, choruses. It, they give you the possibility and the environment to produce truly outstanding work. And, and uh, as British singers, we, we're particularly fortunate in, 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 in that. Um, these pieces, they're, they're, it's like... They're like the Olympics, that you, you spend your life preparing to do these works, and you spend your life, hopefully, preparing to do them as well as and better than they have ever been done. That's what we all strive to do. Now, we may never, ever get there, but while trying to reach that, we're going to produce some very, very significant work. And so working with that kind, kind of drive, with that kind of mentality, with that kind of, of determination... Uh, the possibilities are, the, the, the pieces are not great pieces just because they exist. They, they're great pieces because they have the capability to evolve. Mm. And if you, as, a, as somebody who is creating it or, or bringing these pieces to life, you are a part of that process. So there's something, there's always a fire under your backside, if you like. There's always something pushing you on to be better and better and better. And, and I think that is really, really, really important. That is something that we have. Well, I cannot, for one, wait to see how you have made the Meistersinger evolve. Wonderful to talk to you all. Thank you so much. Brent Havel, Rachel and Gwyn. Wonderful to have you. And we can't wait to see you on stage. We'll let you go and put your feet up now after a long day of rehearsals. Don't forget, it would be lovely to hear from you. We'd love you to join in the conversation tonight. You can tweet us using the hashtag ROHMeisterzinger. Now, I'm really thrilled to be able to welcome the music director of the Royal Opera, Antonio Papano, who'll be exploring Richard Wagner's powerful and moving score in the way that only he can. He'll be joined on the piano by Susanna Stranders and later by tenor Andrew Tortoise. Antonio. Thank you. Good evening, the Meistersinger von Nuremberg. Um, I'm, I've been allotted 30 minutes to talk about a five and a half hour opera, so it's, um, and I'm not very good at keeping in, <laughs> but I have to this evening. Um, I'll start talking about the overture. The overture is very interesting because it's um, different from his other overtures. Um, it was written before the opera, now, you'd, you'd think that that would be, well, of course, but no, not of course. Um, and in this overture, things are explored, um, especially the, the, the pride of Nuremberg, the, the pride of Nuremberg for a figure like Hans Sachs, somebody, a great, great writer. But also, we celebrate, we celebrate this new element, this new person that comes to, that disrupts this
this, uh, Bryn spoke of this idyllic place and this tradition of the master song and its master singers and these rules. And we'll talk about rules in, in, a, in a bit. Um, Wagner's thinking about how to express the tension of the struggle of musical conservatism with the new. And of course, guess which one he represents. Um, it's the new and, and, and he's constantly showing on one hand his respect for tradition, the way things were done, the traditions of Germany. And of course, there's no person, no other composer perhaps tapped into the nationalistic elements. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a negative political way, but you know, the pride of country and of the traditions. Then Wagner, and I think um, he, on the one hand, wants to give you um, the history of music in his country. And then he wants to tear it all down and show you the, the new road, the new way of thinking, the daring of, of his harmonic journeys, the breaking of the rules but making other rules. And it's, it's, a, it's a wondrous environment for uh, making music and for bringing these characters to life because the importance of Hans Sachs, besides his being, I think, uh, yeah, an, an, uh, an unforgettable theatrical character and historical character, but he's the one person who realizes that maybe there is another way of doing things and there's another way of thinking about music, thinking about art and um, and that maybe their traditions need a shake-up. Of course, Wagner's basically telling you about himself. Of course, of course he is. Um, we meet, when we hear the overture and the, these, these C major chords, um, these gleaming C major blocks of sound, um, are... They're, well, they're, they've been in our ear for a long time. But what I want you to listen for, if you can, is, and I'll separate it in a minute, is I want, listen to the total package, and then I want you to listen to the bass line. Because I think this is very important about telling you about this kind of music and how he honors, pays homage, parodies um, old music. Yeah, so, Susie, yeah. go to it. we modulate finally to F from C major to F major. And don't you feel right away this not only uh, harmony and melody and glory on that and, and these, this glorious, proud, traditional tune, but you feel very, very strongly life-affirming rhythm. And he'll talk a lot about rhythm, um, whether through speech, and you'll in, we'll, we'll hear an aria that that um, talks about the the putting together of the song and the rules and the rhythms and the different things, but that's how you get through a six-hour opera, five and a half, is because throughout the evening you're being pumped with with fresh and and yes, life-giving and energy-giving rhythm. It's fantastic. But listen to the bass line. Um, uh, and 
and the bass stay still. Now, why did I, I do that? Well, Wagner is celebrating polyphony, um, part writing, where uh, you have voices, the imitation, but independence of line. So you have these characters, the masters, who all have their own independent lines, if you like, and they all have a point of view. Um, and this independence he needs to show also in music, and this is the greatness of the great Baroque uh, composers, Bach, Handel, um, of course, Buxtehude, all these, all these um, great composers, was this part writing, this polyphony, this, this and virtuosity. So now play the right hand softly, but and play the left hand full. So you hear the. Kind of uh, the bass is also feeding the 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 melody, don 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 don, and the melody follows. It's a, it's a simple device, but it it works miracles in keeping your ear forever interested and forever wanting to follow it. Now uh, this becomes a, a blaze of of. Uh, orchestral color mm -hmm. and we finish with this exuberant trill and we're introduced to the sort of the character of Walter but his interest in the young girl he he sees uh, Ava um, in the in the uh, in the church or the gathering hall um, and the music all of a sudden changes and it's quite abrupt so here's the the, the exuberant trill <laughs> flute Stop there. So don't play the melody now, just play the, the harmonies under there. Listen. Play the E flat when it comes. All of a sudden, a greater sophistication. That's Wagner himself to, 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 uh, infiltrating uh, Nuremberg. Um, and uh, and did you hear those curly cues of melody? Yeah, those. There's a fantasy about that. There's a there's an imagination. And what he's, um, you know, uh, Wagner's uh, supposed to have said, "Kinder, schaffst Neues, schaffst Neues," and um, make something new. And it's all about that. It's all about composing. It's all about being an artist. And it's, it's absolutely fantastic, that. Now, then we get the big uh, chorale, the, the masters, and at their entrance in the, uh, in the final scene in, in Act 3, we're going to, to hear this in all its glory. But we hear a pretty good version um, here. Go. get the idea. That's block chords. So that's quite um, a, a primitive kind of music, but very, very successful, very populous, very easy to listen to, doesn't require you to think at all. You just get, you, you just receive it. And now he starts to, when we talk about the traditions and the glory of, of Nuremberg and its traditions and the importance of Hans Sachs, we get something a little richer still very, very, quite easy to listen to, actually glorious in the orchestra. Uh, uh, Susie, not that it didn't sound <laughs> glorious, but, but um, this will grow and grow and grow and grow and, and you'll feel like you're in musical heaven um, because he, he just creates a world, a kind of a brigadoon of impossible positiveness and, and, and uh, bonheur and, and, and all this. But then... 
Meistersing is a love story too, and it's about young people uh, finding each other. It's about yearning and desire. So uh, Wagner, to show this, has to change the music yet again, and he does so on the next page, Susie, yeah. the top, and you get this quite uh, chromatic harmony, uh, in other words, a much more sophisticated colored harmony to, and an ebb and a, f and a flow um, and a, an up and a down to make it, uh, to, to be a little bit more primitive about it, that is absolutely palpable. He go. Like, I want you. you know. <laughs> One chord better than the other. Now, I can't tell you, that, is, that music is light years away, harmonically speaking, from the C major, easy to receive, um, sort of popular music that, uh, that, that, that he shows us at the beginning, as beautiful as, and as, and as life-affirming as it is. This is much more complex uh, in every way in human way, in a psychological way. Now, we've heard about this prize song keeps getting mentioned, that, um, and uh, in Act 3 we hear it a thousand times, um, because he has to learn it, he has to compose it, he has to rehearse it, and then finally we hear the, the final version of it. But we hear a version of it uh, in the overture, and it's, uh, but it's, we will never hear it really in this form again. Um, it's in 4-4, four, four, in four beats to a bar, and the price song is in three beats to a bar. But this is the version of it. It's a beautiful... Just play the melody, uh, Susie. Etc. Et now, one of the fantastic things about about this melody is that all it is new. It has those curly cues that I talked about, those turns of phrase, those and the, and you'll hear the harmonies are so beautiful underneath. Um, but it also has respect for its past. We have in in baroque music, in in old music, let's call it. There are the use of sequences. Uh, here, it da 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 da. Sometimes baroque music can go on forever. Um, but here we have a sign of it. Da. And he takes that and brings it somewhere. Okay, so, so it's a clever combination of things. Now play it um, all. Um. Terrific. Now, I don't know about you, but I find my ear being brought to the underneath. Just play the left hand. How that that is going on at the same time as the tune. Now play it again, uh, and, and and try to uh, try to take it in. It's 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 uh, it's um, the music is quite quite uh, there's a it's labyrinthian kind of secrets and and love and mm, pers it's very personal. This will develop and become ever more agitated and ever more um, uh, impulsive. Um, there are many devices in music. There's uh, sometimes you can make a tune. Um, you, you hear it sometimes when you hear a big choir singing in Westminster Abbey, and there'll be there'll be the, the main chorale song, and then the 
part of the choir will sing the descant, but not only will they <coughs> sing something may perhaps more florid, they'll sing something maybe in a different time, like, well, they'll sing it, it tw something twice as fast or twice as slow, and then you have a chorale melody, you know. Well, the best example is um, uh, Jesus, Joy of Man's Desiring. That's going on in your dot. You have a slow and a fast music together. There are many devices of making music uh, bring contrast. Here, you hear dum, 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 dum at the very beginning. Now you hear a very a nervous, contracted version of that. I call it sort of miniaturizing. Let's play it slowly, just the tune, as the tune as we know it. Okay, now, now play it. So, one, and dum. Yeah, the left hand too, Susie, come on. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> now, you hear that, that nervous kind of uh, agitated. This music, when we hear it next in that state, um, will be uh, exactly in that state, is in the third act when Beckmesser, the character that um, that has not been mentioned very much tonight, um, is who's represented by somehow one chord. <laughs> you know, it tells you everything about, uh, about him. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, he, he comes on to sing his song and he's uh, fretting and, and nervous. And, we, and so that music fits perfectly with just making the overture twice as fast or three times as fast, whatever you want to call it. Um, we've got exactly the right, we've got the right sounds, but they're too fast. You know, and it's brilliantly thought, thought about. Right after that comes Walter's music. Yada listen to this. You've just heard dun da 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 ba da ba dum dum dum. Yeah, now listen to this. The old music. Yeah. So play that again. Yeah. Da 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 da. Yeah. Da 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 da. That is the Wagner of Meistersinger, of Tristan und Isolde. That. Searching that that I want, I, I need, I must have somehow, and that's what um, somehow this overture is so clever at bringing about. If you're just aware of of this tension between the old and the new. Now, I spoke before about um, uh, rules, and we're going to hear an aria that David, the young apprentice, he's the apprentice to Hans Sachs, so. Quite self-important young man, but but you know when you you know you know all the rules, and you, you you can list them and you go through them and you can and 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 you're explaining to somebody and you know and it it becomes more about the rules than actually his becoming a singer, is, which is what he wants to to do. He's learning at the same time to be to be uh, a cobbler and and together he's he's learning how to how to sew. How, how to sew um, the shoe and the, the silk through and all that, but he's also learning how to rhyme and how to compose. And, 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 but he's be, bewildered and bewildering when he has to list them to, to Walter uh, because Walter wants to, wants to take part uh, in the singing competition. Now, before we get to that, I just, I just want to share with you the beginning of the prelude to Act 3 because... This story takes place at Midsummer Night, right? And uh, the 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 part, the thing that you know very very well about Midsummer Night's Dream is that part. Play the opening melody of the Act Three. Very interesting, that isn't it? Uh, uh, it's it, it's it's interesting because Hans Sachs has lost his wife, lost his child, 
And the, the whole idea of marriage and winning the girl is very much in the air. But it's also a difficult, very, very difficult subject for Hans Sachs. Now, this theme, which is very dark and very, very brooding and very disturbing, is a disillusionment with the world. He says the world's gone crazy. Pe the people, their actions, I just don't understand. What, what, why, why are they, why does the world have to fight? Why are we fighting? And today, my God, what a message that is for today. Because, some, you know, if you're not with me, you're, you're my enemy. If you, you know, this understanding between people is, is gone. We've just had a riot at the end of Act Two. And he's, what's going on in this world? It's the most beautiful piece of music. If you, if you take away one piece of music from this piece, it's the prelude to Act Three. I don't have time to go into it now. Um, but um, go home and listen to it. And listen to it repeatedly <laughs> is my, is, is, is my, uh, I remember being in Bayreuth for the first year and I, I found this record of Karian at very old age, at the end of, the end of his life, and he just recorded this piece, among others, um, Overtures, Tristan, and, and, uh, and I just couldn't stop listening to it. I thought it was the saddest thing I'd ever listened to in my entire life and yet I kept putting it on, you know. Uh, yeah, do that. It's a, it's a good exercise. Okay, um, Andrew Tortoise, sing for us some rules. <laughs> I wish I could translate uh, some of this for you. It's so, it's, um, he, 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 he lists all the different modes of singing, and some of them have the really funny names. Um, he, um, some, one is called um, the short mode, the long mode, the overlong tones, the paper mode, the black ink mode, the scarlet, the blue, and the verdant tones, the hawthorn bloom, straw harm, straw, I don't even know what the word is, straw harm, fennel mode, the tender, the dulcet, the rosy tones. So different tones, different modes, different ways of singing. And it's illustrated in the kind of vocal writing. And it's a virtuosic piece of music. Of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's funny and it's a list. But actually to hear his voice do all those different things. At one point, we learn that he actually has learned how to sing. He has learned how to sing smoothly and legato with a bel canto way. But um, anyway, we'll get to that. OK, but he, he talks about short, long, <laughs> this, that. You must do that. You can't do that. Then you know, all this. Uh, you you get the idea. But uh, just yeah, have fun. Listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> Der Singermeister starb, gewinnt sich nicht an einem Tag. In Nürnberg, der größte Meister, mich lehrt die Kunst Hans Sachs. Schon voll ein Jahr mich unterweist er, dass ich als Schüler war. Schumacherei und Poeterei, Lern ich da an einer Neu, hab ich das Lieder glatt geschlagen. Lern ich Vokal und Konsonanz sagen, mix dich den Draht erst fest und steif, was sich dann rein dich wohl begreift. Im Fremen schwingen, im Schlich die Hall, was Sturm, was Klingen, was Maß, was Zahl, den Leisten im Schurz, was lang, was kurz. Was hart, was liegt, hell oder blind, was weisen, was milben, was klebt, silben, was pausen, was körner, was blumen, was dörner. Das alles lehrt ich mit Sorg und Acht. Wie weit nun meint ihr, dass ich's gebracht? Walter in reaction to what he's just said because he's combined talking about making shoes and making poetry. He says, well, it sounds like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to, with those rules, I'm gonna be able to make a pretty damn good pair of shoes. Gute Schuhe. <laughs> Die Richt 
rechten Naht und den rechten Draht mit Gut der Finger schollen, den Bade zu versohlen. Und dann erst kommt der Abgesang, dass der nicht kurz und nicht zu lang und auch keinen Reimen hält, der schon im Stollen gestellt. Wer alles das merkt, weiß und kennt, wird doch immer noch nicht Meister genannt. But I don't want to be a cobbler. I want to go into, I want to learn about singing. Tell me about singing. Ja, hätte ich's nur selbst schon zum Singer gebracht. Wer glaubt wohl, was das für Mühe macht? Oh, it's so hard, so difficult. I've been trying and I... But here we, we hear that he can sing, actually. <laughs> different types of tones here. Der kurze, short, lang und überlang. The overly long note. <laughs> Die Schreibpapier. Die Schreibpapier. <laughs> Schwarz hinten weiß. Der rote, blau und grüne Ton, die Hagelblühstrohhalm fängelweiß, der zarte, der süße, sweet one and the rose. Kurzen Liebe, der vergessene Ton, die Rosalie, der Hilfsfalt ein Weiß, die Regenbogen, die Nachtigall weiß, die englische Zimt, die Zimt für den Weiß, frisch von den Ranzen, grün, lindern, blühweiß. Es one called the Frog. Die Frasche, die Kälber, die Stiege. For Christ's sake. <laughs> das sind nur die Namen. Those are just the names. Now you have to Nun learn how to <laughs> Wie die meiste sie gestellt, geht fort und hoch, muss lehrlich klingen, wo steigt die Stimme und wo sie fällt. Fahrt sie nicht so hoch, so tief nicht an, als es die Stimme erreichen kann. Mit dem Atem spart, dass er nicht klappt und gar am Ende überschnappt, vor dem Wort mit der Stimme ja nicht so und nach dem Wort mit dem Mund auch nicht ruht. Nicht ändert ein Blum und Koloratur hielt sie rat fest nach des Meisters Spur. Verletzte dir, wird er dir, erlöte euch und kämpft ihr dir. Wer sonst euch alles auch gelungen, da hätte die Gase sollen. Trotz großem Fleiß und Hemd sich feind, sich selbst noch brat es nicht so weit. So oft ich's versucht und nicht gelingt. Die Knie rief, schlapp, weiß der Meister mir singt. Wenn dann Jungfer Lehrer nicht Hilfe weiß, sing ich die Heiden Rot und Wasser weiß. Nehmt euch ein Bein. Spiel dran, oh 
Thank you very much, Susie Stranders. <laughs> did, you hear, did you hear the word coloratura? Coloratura, and, a big, and very fast scale. So it's all there. It's all there. <laughs> it's all there. Thank Tony, you very much. Andrew, Susanna, thank you, thank you so, so much. <laughs> As usual, after hearing Tony do one of his whistle-stop tours through these wonderful works, I really will never hear the music in the same way again. Absolutely joyous. Thank you to Antonio Papano, pianist Susanna Stranders, and tenor Andrew Tortoise. And thank you to you all for joining us all around the world. We are absolutely delighted to have uh, viewers in Italy and Canada, Alaska, Brazil, Mexico, Macedonia, to name but a few. Do keep the conversation coming with the hashtag ROH. Meisterzinger, and of course, a warm uh, and gra grateful uh, hello to everyone here at the Claw Studio upstairs in Covent Garden as well. Well, I'm really thrilled that now I have the chance to welcome to this insight the director of this production, also the director of opera here at Covent Garden, Caspar Holton. He's been director of opera here since 2011, and Dean Meisterzinger, very sadly, will be the final production that he directs before he goes uh, on to uh, pastures new, shall we say. Uh, hopefully we'll be seeing more of him though, but what a brilliant swan song for Casper. Casper, lovely to see you. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> oh, that was certainly life-affirming energy. I love the idea that the music itself kind of gets you going through that. Wonderful to have that. Um, Kasper, I have to ask, why Die Meistersinger and why now for you? Uh, it's, it's a, it looks like a better planning than it is. Uh, <laughs> it looks like the perfect farewell, you know, end my time in London with a comedy about the relationship between artists, critics and audiences. What could possibly be a better way to go? In fact, the decision to do Meistersinger for me directly was made long before I had decided to leave. Uh, years ago, I sat down with Bryn for lunch, and I said, what roles would you be keen to revisit? And he said, Falstaff, and he said, Hans Sachs. And we immediately said, OK, Meistersinger it is. It's time to build a new production around Bryn. And I have always had great pleasure doing Wagner. I always really enjoyed that. The idea of doing this piece with Bryn and with Tony just all came together. Later on, for private reasons, my, my children growing up and us deciding that they should go to school in Denmark, uh, I decided to leave. and. I decided then, although my contract ran out last summer, I said I must extend it so that I, I, I can finish my thing and do that project. And then it just ended up being my, my farewell show, I guess. Well, we're very sad to be losing you, but we're very happy that it's all coming together for this amazing sounding new production. We obviously talked to some of the cast members earlier. Now, just briefly, you and Wagner, you talked about having a happy time directing Wagner in the past. You've directed The Ring Cycle, Tannhäuser, Lohengrin. This is your first time directing Wagner, though, at Covent Garden. What does this particular house bring to a production of the Meistersinger? How do you work with Covent Garden itself? I think it's really important to try not to think too much about that, because, like you talk to the performers about, if you think about, oh, my God, this is an important production and this is Covent Garden and we have to impress people, then you stop listening to your instincts and it's all about vanity, really. Um, but having said that, the pieces, as we heard Tony so brilliantly explain, it's all about the tension between tradition and innovation. Mm -hmm. And no place on earth represents that tension to me like London. I was, you, know, you thought I would tell you the Royal Opera House, <laughs> but I mean, but London, this city, this great city with so much tradition, legacy, heritage, mm. celebrating all that, putting on a good show, opening of parliament, let's dress up, put on traditional costume, wigs, we celebrate our past, and yet it's the place where people from all over the world come and do the most brilliant innovation where the new thrives. That tension, that clash, you walk into places in London, you think, this is a time machine, I've, you know, I'm in the past, and yet, right outside the door, the most brilliant innovation is happening. That tension is here. So the piece is, in many ways, very much about London, I think. And how has London 
played into your approach? Because you've set it here. <coughs> well, ish. Um, I uh, remember when I came to London, people, someone asked me, what's your club? <laughs> and not being a, a, a Brit, I thought, like, what do you mean? You know, and they said, yeah, what's your club? What club are you a member? You know, is it like a gym or, or you know, <laughs> I just think, at least in Scandinavia, and I think in continental Europe, the idea of belonging to a club is completely foreign. And, and only no Scotland... wonder he wanted his children to grow up. <laughs> no. Not here. But I have to Stay say <laughs> that when I found out that some clubs still don't accept female members, that was a bit of a shock. And actually, that maybe goes back to the, to the sexual politics in this piece. When, you, when you're starting Meistersinger, all my colleagues, all the other directors whom you want to impress, they always say, OK, you're doing Meistersinger. What are you doing about the German nationalism in the piece? Hans Sachs' final speech. I think actually, first of all, that is more about the question of populism versus elitism, that tension about should you ask the people about everything. It's so easy to go with Hans Sachs and say, yeah, he's right, mm -hmm. but actually, you know, is it always wrong to celebrate tradition and establishment? Or, you know, that tension is there very much. But even more so, people say it's so shocking with this statement of nationalism in the end. Hang on, it's a piece where a father offers up his own daughter as a prize in a competition for men to win. What's the most shocking statement yeah. of You're the worried two? about nationalism? Yeah, no, you're worried about the national, nationalism at the end. I'm worried about a father saying, my daughter can be a prize. So, like Rachel was saying, we are looking, and I think Sachs is a big part of that. He's the only one who's a bit queasy about this whole plan from the beginning, although it's clearly all worked out that he will be the winner. In this production, we're making it extra clear the Meisters have wives, all of them except Pogner, Eva's father, who's obviously not going to compete for her hand, uh, Sachs and Beckmesser. So it makes it very clear that this is Porkner's plan. Sachs and Beckmesser will compete and clearly Sachs will win and they will marry. And even Eva knows this. And then she meets this new man and although she had always thought, yes, Sachs would be a great husband, suddenly she just sees, that is different. That I have to go with. Um, so we're trying to play with the sexual politics of the piece and I've actually always done that with Wagner. I've always found it interesting how Wagner's vim, women can bring you so much when you start really, on the surface of it, they all have to die so that men can be relieved and, you know, it, it, it all... But actually, the women in Wagner gives you so much. I did that in Lohengrin, I did that in Tannhäuser, certainly my ring cycle. Well, I was going to say, with Brunhilde, you know, she survives immolation, starts you, a new world you order. You would not believe when I had... How does that go ring, down? So many times when I spoke about the ring cycle afterwards, I had an, always a man raising their hand when there was Q&A and say, it was all fine, but how can Brynhilde survive? She must die. And you think like, yeah, okay, that's maybe time to stop sacrificing women in Wagner operas. Maybe it's time to start subverting that. And I think it's there. When you look at it, when you listen to it, Wagner's women are strong. Elsa and Lohengrin, we all assume that she's doing the wrong thing because she's asking the forbidden questions. A leader comes and says, I'll take the country to war. You can just never ask me who I am, what I did before, or where I come from. She's the only one who asks questions. Well, thank you for asking questions. Yeah. There's a lot of strength in Wagner's women, and I want to pull that out. And certainly with Eva, we're finding some strength. Well, Casper, the sisterhood thanks you for that. <laughs> Even if there may always be a man that puts his hand up, be warned, by the way. Don't put your hand up and ask the wrong no, question. No, you can. Um, speaking about the design, you mentioned uh, the pomp and circumstance and London, certain ceremonial outfits. I think we have some images from the designer. Oh, there we are. We're not going to give away, away the set, but Spoiler I, will, alert, I yeah. will say as much as say, rather than represent the three naturalistic, they, it's, it is very naturalistic in a way. And the whole key for me to doing the production came when Tony a couple of months ago said to me, it's all in the detail. And that was like an eye opener. It's all in the detail. It's the human detail. It's getting all the characters right. And every scene is actually acted out in a quite naturalistic, detailed, complex way. Having said that, the sets we wanted to represent not just the physical locations, but the microcosmos of this, let's say, male club, where men come together and where, when the meeting starts, the women get sent out so they can discuss art and women. And, and in this club, in this microcosmos, where you try to uphold the idea of legacy, of tradition, of the past, that starts breaking because, as we heard, there's a virus coming in. And quite literally, it's starting to come apart at the seams. And even though they put on the medieval gear once again, it's like you know, the first time I came to the Garrick Club, you walk in, it's beautiful, you think like, wow, I, I've just been warped back, in, you know, a hundred years back in time, until you find out they have Wi-Fi. 
And there are power sockets, and the kitchens are modern. Wi-Fi, but no women. It, well, see. <laughs> Priority. Women serving staff, funnily enough, so we will see, look at that as well. So the idea of, of, of the clash between the new and the old, dressing up, it, although you might wear modern glasses and you still put on medieval gear, that tension is so you will get beautiful big medieval costumes, but it's, it's costumes. Can we see a few of the costumes? Yeah, we should. There we are, there's Walter. Walter is a foreigner. He comes from the outside, he's not a Nuremberger. He comes with fresh inspiration. He's very much in the beginning of the rebel, so he, he refuses to put on a tie when he enters the club. You know, Don't he, go into the Garrick he, without he, a tie. Well, exactly. Goodness me. And he sings, and he quite enjoys being not dressing up, although he's a nobleman. He kind of plays that down and is like, I'm the artist. And he clearly has a journey to go through to harness that energy, to somehow not just be the rebel or the provocateur. We as artists sometimes, at the beginning, we love upsetting people, and then we find out actually upsetting is not a goal in itself, mm. unless you have something meaningful and sincere, honest, that you want to achieve with it. Um, so uh, Eva is, as we said, on a big journey. In this piece. I th the piece is all about change. More than anything, it's about change. And all of the characters change significantly in the piece. Eva changes from being a, a schoolgirl who does basically what daddy says to being hopefully at the end an independent woman who says, I can't be a member of this world anymore. Mm. Um, they dress her up uh, as a prize and we quite literally, even the production, we have a prize cup that she gets sat in. So quite literally, wow. she's a prize, yeah? Her father has spent a lot of money on it. Um, <laughs> sax, can we talk about sax for two seconds? Let's absolutely talk about sax. Mary. The role is so, as, as everyone spoke about already, so complex. For me, again, it's he more than anybody is about change. I'm sure we've all been through or will go through in our lives the big, I mean, I'm certainly now in a couple of weeks going to go through a big change. Sachs being this celebrated pillar of knowledge and tradition sees that he needs something new comes. Mm. But it also provokes a huge identity crisis. I think his two big monologues, the Frieda monologue, he says, what was that? Mm. And only at the end of it, he says, I liked it. I don't, it doesn't fit any rules, but I, I kind of, it's like in the middle of the boo storm. You know, they all go boo at the end of act one. And he says, yeah, to be honest, there's something there. It's not there yet, but it's something there. There's talent. But then in act three, when he has to realize, he has to give up Eva. So, his wife is long dead, and he thought maybe he would have a second wife, mm. but he has to give her up because she clearly is in love with another man. He has to accept that new role. He has to even accept that he's not the great artist anymore because something new that he can never be. Having lost that youthful arrogance, he can never be that again. Mm. So he ends up at the beginning of Act 3 with this sense where Tony played that melody of having lost the wedding, having lost everything, and now saying, who am I then? Midlife crisis, if there ever was one. I am no longer the young artist. I'm no longer the young lover. Who am I going to be then? And then, you know, to put it very crudely, he goes into management. He, <laughs> but I mean it. He decides in his big Varner monologue, he says, it's all about Varner. Like Tony says, is what is the world coming to? But what he's actually saying is, what am I coming to? I was part of this riot. What is this coming to? And why are we all behaving like, why did I disrupt? Because in the second act, let's not forget, he starts the riot. Mm. Why did I do that? That was a nasty thing to do. And then he decides to become the producer, the promoter, the helper, the in, intendant, the director of opera, the one who steps back and says, I will help Walter go on stage. I will help the new come forward. I will accept that secondary role. And I will, at the end, become quite a, a politician. He runs for office at the end. You know, he starts making big speeches about how to look at national politics. I just think there's something so... Interesting, and it's interesting because the character, it's obviously it's very easy in a way to like Hans Sachs, and there are many moments where we like him, if not for anything else, than just because he's so human. But it's and always... He's not Beckmesser. It's, yeah, but then again, I like Beckmesser. Mm. I find a great empathy with Beckmesser. You know, this man who's tolerated in the club, he's the public servant, you know, they need a good link to the mayor's office, so he's, he's accepted, but he's not a businessman like the others. He's never had a wife. He hopes to just show them all that he can do this, that he could be a great artist, that he could win Eva, that he could somehow be accepted. And he can only do it by the rules. That's his, and when they take them away, he doesn't know who he is because he's so insecure. Mm. In that insecurity, I find great empathy with him, and I recognize the fear that Beckmesser has, and the maybe shortcuts he takes, and clearly he shouldn't get Eva. But he shouldn't be put on the spot like Sachs does in the last act either. That's like reality TV, making someone go on the stage and embarrass them to the point where they can never be he can never be someone in that town again. So Sachs is a great character, but he's also sometimes a villain. Mm. And Beckmesser is clearly a pedantic, 
you know, man who has rules for the... He's, oh my God, he's a critic. <gasps> um, Just figured it out. But I kind of like him. And that's the, I think, great thing about Wagner. I've always felt Alberic is the person in the ring cycle that maybe understands the best. If mm. all women say, come here, come here, tease you, tease you, you get no love for me because you're ugly. Wouldn't that make you do awful things? You know, in Wagner, there are all the characters, you know, never mind his own writings and all of that, but if you look at his characters, his music, it's all there. Sachs is, I think, the greatest example of that. He's clearly sympathetic, but he also does nasty things because he's going through a huge identity crisis and working with Brin on that and finding that through line. And in the third act, seeing how that change comes about where he accepts a new role, that is really interesting. Wow. Cannot wait to see this. <laughs> Neither <How> can I. <laughs> <laughs> can I just ask how common a situation it is that you have someone you said it was about building this around Bryn that you work together you want to do something and, and how, how often does that happen or does it take an artist as singular as Bryn Terfel it's is? It's clear that like this season we built you know R R Rachel was brilliant as Marshall but we built that production about Rene wanting to do Marshall mm. and it's clear that we have although Gregory would be a wonderful hotel we have built the production about Jonas wanting to make his his role debut so it does happen that that major artists say here's a role I would like to debut or revisit now it's time for me to do a new production. I'd like to spend the, the, the amount of time that a new production requires to really go into that, and that you build a production around them. But clearly, unless you get everything else around them, I mean, Bryn is fantastic, but, but Sachs cannot carry Meister Singer. You need, you need the Tony, you need uh, actually all of the five, six lead characters and the chorus, and the, even, I think the beauty of this cast, if I may say so, I'm having such a good time. I mean, it's, it's scary and fantastic at the same time. We go into the room every day and we just have so much fun and find so much richness. I've always had a hard time quite pinning down Meister Singer, but when you work with it, it all makes sense. But, and, and that's because even down to The Last Apprentice, it's cast with people who want to work, dedicated, interested, passionate, good artists. The scary thing about Meister Singer is that, boy, every day we just, I'm just behind because it's so bloody long. And you know, every, you know, in a normal production, when I did King Roger, you could run it twice in a rehearsal, you know, the whole opera. And here, you stage all of Dutchman, and that's just the third act, then you need to stage acts one and two as well. You, you just, every day I feel like I have to push on, I have to push on. We can't stop and talk about this detail, we really should, but we have to push on. Finding out when to stop and get the detail right and when to push on, so it, it is quite, hard work we go on stage on sunday and before that we ha need to have a shape to everything uh, we will get there but it's it's not we're not sitting on our hands it's only wednesday and coffee. Yeah, <laughs> i know it sounds as if you've also had to find singers who are tremendous actors which is let's face it not always the case in opera and certainly not always the case in wagner but it sounds as if the level of nuance and the detail of those human beings rather than just tropes and characters required is immense. And actually, I would say today, actually, the old cliche that singers are not great actors, if you look at most of the leading opera singers today, the people in this house, actually most of them are fantastic actors mm. because the competition is so hard that people put a lot of effort into that. But it is beautiful when you see a lot of you will know someone like Jeremy White, who is in many, many of our productions in smaller parts, him as one of the masters. It's just a character study of its own over the hours, how he develops that character with a fondness, but also with, with a bit of caricature. You know, down to each, I hope that you will really be able to follow each character and think like there's an artist who takes responsibility for his bit of this. So these people I work with in this production are not just singers, they are artists. And they have the to best. be comedians too. For you, this is one of Wagner's great comedies, maybe his only great comedy. Well, I did Das Liebesverbot by Wagner, which he wrote when he was 24, I think, or something, and that's a comedy too. Listen, I think in many ways Siegfried is a comedy. There's a lot of comedy in Rheingold. There's a lot of, there's even comedy in Tristan, you know? Uh, and there's a lot of very sincere, profound depression. I think Beck, Sachs is probably depressed when he sings his one monologue. Mm. So it's like Shakespeare. The trick is that uh, without the comedy, the tragedy doesn't work. Without the yeah. tragedy, the comedy is in, in, uninteresting. It's not a farce. It's a comedy in that it, it, it makes, and that's where Martin surprises you, it makes fun of the critics, it sometimes makes fun of the audiences, but it really makes fun of ourselves too, of the artists and how vain we are, we are and how insecure we are. So in the way it takes the world not too seriously and thus explores it in that respect, it's a comedy. And I think people would be astounded if they didn't know Wagner well to hear you talk about it in those ways. Do you think there's a misperception about who he is as a composer and what his works are? There's a lot of stuff out there around Wagner Again, when you come to the work, when you actually consider the scores, when you see it, 
I think people have a very different experience of it. So all we can do is try to try to do that justice and put it on stage. And like Gwen said, try to be the very best we can be. And maybe we will fail, but we will, in that process, have found something. Because these works keep opening themselves up. And I think if, as an audience member, you come in with that openness too. If you come in with too fix an expectation... I mean, Meister Singer is a piece about the new. And so in this piece, maybe more than ever before, surely you need to come and say, Wagner wanted us to be open. That is what I ask, I guess. Let's hope so. Uh, it is a touring, it is a co-production. You will um, also take it to the National Centre for the Performing Arts in Beijing, Opera yeah. Australia. Do you have to take something different, anything extra into consideration when you're making a production that <coughs> will tour? Whether it's cultural, whether it's practical, what other stages you're working on? Practical, sure. When we have co-producers, of course, by the technical process, from the beginning we know those other stages and we know that it has to fit those other stages with maybe some minor adjustments, but it, it's been thought out. And sure, we have a discussion with them. I find that nowadays, actually, that human message in the works... I don't find the cultural differences to be big, that big that you can't, a production can't travel. But sure, you do think about it. And I'm sure the production will somehow be different in China with a Chinese chorus and with a mix of Chinese and Western artists. And there will be a different discussion because it will be, opera will be at a different stage there. And that's just super interesting. But the fundamental approach you put into it has to be just personal and honest. And that means that when I go to China and meet the artists there, it will change because I will come with my honesty and they will come with theirs and then something will evolve. You can, all you can do is try to be honest. I was lucky enough last week to be presenting the relay of Wolf Works here uh, for the Royal Ballet. And one of the fascinating things that Wayne McGregor talked about as a, being a choreographer was that his dancers are his co-authors, that when he makes a piece, oh, they are absolutely fundamental to what happens. When you're uh, working with an opera like this, do you think of your singers and your actors as co-authors in a way of Absolutely. that Absolutely. And I actually try in my preparation. It's something that's taken me many years to, to kind of get, the, get the, the guts to do it. But I try to prepare in a way where I know what I want to say, but not to know exactly how to say it scene by scene. Which means when I come into the room, I put a pressure on myself to open up and listen to my intuition because I, I, I don't know yet. I, I know what I want to say and I know, of course, the basic outline, but I don't know how to tell the story, which means I look at them and I react to who Bryn is and how he expresses the pressure and what ideas he has and which ways. So, yeah, they are very much so. And I think when we do it in Beijing with a different cast, it will be different because they will be hopefully co-authoring that. So while staying within the framework of the house we are building, there are many rooms you can occupy, there are many ways to tell that story. And surely for the audience, if it was just me trying to tell everybody where to be and how to do things, it would be a boring production. Yeah, it has to. I think there have been opera directors and directors generally in the past who have wanted to lay down their iron will and it has been less of a generous collaboration. More in the end, on the 11th of March, I'm going to sit in row K with sweaty palms <laughs> and I don't even have a red flag I could wave and say, that doesn't count, you know. I have to trust them. Tony has a remote control, you know, <laughs> the hands, yeah? I don't. So unless I make them great, unless I make them believe in it, unless I make them passionate about what we're doing... Uh, you know, Gwen, for instance, when we talked to her earlier, he has such a fantastic... He's thought so much about this role and the almost anger he comes in with in some of those scenes makes him a real rock star. And I thought about when we talked about it before, youthfulness. Well, youthfulness is not just a question of age. Youthfulness okay. is a sense of approach, of attitude. And I think the way he brings that to the character really helps me mould it. The way Rachel asks me questions all the time, she keeps provoking me of, have you thought this through? And that makes me sharp on my thinking and suddenly makes me go, yeah, she's right, actually we do need a bit of tenderness here. I hadn't thought of that. And so, absolutely wonderful. Casper Holden, forever young, I know you're always <laughs> That's will the good miss thing in the opera world, you're greatly. still considered young at 43. <laughs> We will miss you so very much. Thank you so much for being with us. And Casper's new production of Die Meisterzinger, as we just heard, hits the stage here on Saturday the 11th of March. It runs until the 31st of March. There are a very few tickets left, so if you want to be here 
in this magnificent opera house to see it as part of the audience. Head on over to the Royal Opera House website and see if you can still snap up some tickets. Well, thank you so much to all of our guests tonight. Bryn Tervel, Gwyn Hughes-Jones, Rachel Sorensen, Antonio Papano, Andrew Tortoise, Susanna Stranders, and of course, the one and only Casper Holton. Thanks also to our wonderful audience here in the Claw Studio upstairs and to all of you watching around the world via YouTube. It's been, from my point at least, a very insightful indeed uh, evening and I hope that you've enjoyed it too. But from all of us now, good night. <laughs>